Hello, I'm Lynn Shepherd, Director of the Masood Entrepreneurship Centre, and I'd like to welcome you all to our speaker series, Entrepreneurs at Manchester. Our centre offers programmes in enterprise and entrepreneurship for students in all schools across the University of Manchester. And our aim is to inspire and encourage our graduates to become the next generation of entrepreneurs within existing businesses or by creating their own, changing the world and making a difference. So Entrepreneurs at Manchester allows us to introduce successful entrepreneurs and their businesses and lets them share their insights with us. And today it's my great pleasure to welcome Joe Foster, who developed Reebok into one of the world's most famous sports brands, having started from a small factory in North Lancashire in Bolton. Since the late 19th century, um, the Foster family had been handmaking running shoes, supplying the likes of Eric Little and Harold Abrams, which were immortalized in the film Chariots of Fire, as well as providing boots to most football league clubs. And I've really loved finding out more about the history of, of Reebok. But a family feud between Joe's father and his uncle about the direction of their business led to Joe and his brother Jeff setting up a new company. Inspired by the success of Adidas and Puma, Reebok was born. And in 2020, Joe's story, Shoemaker, was published. It is a powerful and inspiring tale of triumph against all the odds, with a lot of lessons for entrepreneurs of today, revealing the challenges and sacrifices that go into creating a world leading brand. It is also the story of how a small local business or a startup can transform itself with the right products and the right vision into something much, much bigger. There will also be an opportunity for Joe to answer your questions a little later. So please do post them in the chat. But I'm really honored to be able to start the questioning of Joe this afternoon. So I'm hoping it's going to be a very interesting conversation for all of you. And I'm really looking forward to it. So let me begin by asking you, Joe, you started the business with your brother, how important was having a partner in those early days? And would you recommend having a co-founder to those planning to start a business today? Well, Lynn, thank you for the invitation and uh, the opportunity to, as you said, tell my story. Um, it is, it's, a, it's a thought that I had. Do I, do I need to tell a story? Well, things happened that made me tell a story and when you when we start about now you say is it important to have a partner when we started we didn't know we were part of the foster family as you said my father and uncle they were feuding what they were feuding about i don't know i still don't know to this day really what the bottom line was on this but there were five years between them in age there were only two years between jeff and myself and uh, maybe maybe Jeff was cleverer than I was. I didn't purposely feel we when we when we work together, we've got to work together. Uh, okay, we saw Adidas with Adidas and Rudy. Dada. They, they were fighting. Well, they had the good sense. Rudy had the good sense. Move out. Set up his own factory. Become Puma. Unfortunately, the Foster family didn't. They just kept feuding. So the only way that uh, we could do anything about that as we, Jeff and myself, had to remove ourselves from the foster family. So we, we moved out because we saw what was going wrong. Now, is it good to have a partner? For me, it was very good. Maybe for Jeff also, it was very good. But Jeff loved, he, he loved making shoes. He loved the factory. That's, that's where he spent his time. That's what he wanted to do. And he just said to me, Joe, you do everything else. Oh, okay. So what is everything else? Well, I must have made many, many mistakes. And I'm sure that Jeff must have been fuming about the mistakes I made. But we never, we never ever had a crossword. So maybe because he thought, well, he didn't want to do it or he couldn't do it. And mistakes will happen. And we did. We, we had a lot of challenges. And, uh, but as I say, 
as a partner, Jeff was always there. He, he looked after the factory. Unfortunately for, for me and for his family, Jeff, Jeff died just when we got into America, just at the time we brought him through. So he never saw the, the growth that we had. He, he never saw that. But uh, and that, that was a great tragedy. But uh, it, it, was good, it was good for me to have Jeff there all the time because I knew that the factory would just keep going and yeah. anything I needed would still be there. Yeah, I think you may make a very good point. You had complementary skills and different interests in the business. So actually you were able to work together. You were not competing in the same area. You were not arguing about, you know, which market to, 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 to go for next or which um, new manufacturing process to use within the factory. So you actually had your own areas that you you focused on and that's probably quite an important um lesson to learn um and you were obviously able to work really effectively together it's very sad that, that that jeff didn't see um the business succeed as it did um but hopefully he was looking down and continuing to support you but things don't <laughs> yes. things don't always go according to plan joe do they so how have you how have you personally dealt with that well, I mean, we, we can first of all start off with uh, 18 months after we uh, started the business. And we, start, we, we left Foster's and we started as Mercury Sports Footwear. Mercury Sports Footwear, well, if you read the book, you find that we were Mercury Sports Footwear. But 18 months in, uh, our, our accountant, he said, boys, you're doing very well. You, you're making some money and that's good, but you better register that name, Mercury. And... Uh, we were naive. I'm 25 or 20, 23, and Jeff is 25, and probably then be 24. Look, we were young. What can go wrong? Nothing. You set up your business, that's it. Fine, we, we liked it, great. And we had the, uh, the winged messenger, that was our logo. And uh, so our accountant said, well, register that. And I, I'm saying, well, why register it? Because we were J.W. Foster, I'm sure they didn't register. And he said, well, that's different. You don't need to register your own name. You can <laughs> use your own name, that's fine. But you're, you're going out there as a Mercury and you must register that name. Okay, so how do we do that? Oh, you go see this patent agent in Manchester and they'll do it for you. Okay, so I went to see the patent agent and I told him that we, we need to register our name. So he, uh, he immediately set about checking this. And he found in the register that the name Mercury is pre-registered. So uh, he inquired about this and it was Lotus and Delta. They were a big shoe company, part of British Shoe Corporation. And they, they would sell it to us for a thousand pounds. Now that's okay. But you know, we set, set up a whole factory for 250 pounds. The whole factory, it only cost us 250, a thousand pounds was out of sight. And of course we didn't have a, uh, we didn't have a company that the bank would lend us a thousand pounds. So the patent agent said, well, you'll have to change your name then. And he said, don't bring me one name, bring me 10. Well, I don't know if you've ever sat down around the table and thought, Actually, this is our company. You know, we, we have to be in love with this. We, we need to be in this. So. To cut this short a bit, yes, we, we decided we'd sit down with uh, Falcon, Falcon Sports. That's, that's a good name, yeah. Cougar, Cougar Sports, why not? But let me take you back to 1943. I'm eight years old. And like COVID, we couldn't go anywhere. During the war, we couldn't do anything. But there were local events. And the local event, I won a 60-yard race running. One big advantage I had, I had Foster Spikes on. Well, not many of the people could afford spike shoes in those days. So I won the race and I went up for my prize. And what did I get? I got a dictionary. And I'm saying, where's the football? I, I, I'm a kid. I'm eight years old. Where's my football? I, said, I got a dictionary. But as it happened, it was a Webster's dictionary. And a Webster's dictionary is an American dictionary. And an American dictionary has a lot of different spellings from an English dictionary. So at the time, I was probably a bit disgusted with being given a dictionary and it just sort of lay around for many, many years. But here I am now in 1960 and my dictionary, my Webster's dictionary is there. And I like the letter R. 
So I opened my book and let it out. And very soon, as I'm thumbing through, and I come across Reebok. What's that? R-W-B-O-K. It's a small South African gazelle. We're a running company. Gazelle. Wow. Top of the list. That's it. Right. Went back to the agent and uh, he said, okay, he said, thank you for the 10 names. We'll check them out. As it happened, Reebok was the only one that came out that we could use. It was clear. But a couple of small things, but nothing much. Um, so, we're, But the registrar, he had a little caveat on this. And he said, well, we can only put you in the B section of the register. And we said, why? Well, if anybody makes or tells us they're making shoes out of Reebok skin, we can't stop them. Well, Jeff and I will look at each other and think, yeah, that's never going to happen. <laughs> never. So we became Reebok. We said, we'll have Reebok. Ten years later, the registrar was to come back to us and say, we've moved you now from the B section to the A section. Why? Because everybody knows now that Reebok is a, is a sports shoe. Yeah. So yeah. You know, these are the questions. And I think what taught us you know, the lesson, because we had lots of things, is that, okay, problems are sent really to, to test you. Yeah. Because instead of saying, oh, my God, what's going on? Instead of doing that, we... You, you've got to say, well, how do we turn this into an advantage? Because our second problem was a letter from Adidas. We'd only been going four years. And the letter from the Adidas lawyer, we, our silhouette was two stripes and a T-bar. And they said that infringed their three stripes. <clears throat> we didn't have the money to fire them. We didn't want to fire them. And five minutes, we were looking at each other and thinking, hmm, dear, what you? Then he ever said, just a minute. Adidas know we're here. You know, we're small, but Adidas think it necessary to send us a letter. So what did we do? We changed our silhouette. And we got what is now the, the arrow on the side there. And, um, and it's better. It, it, it's, it's a better silhouette. So we come out with something better. And, and I think that the lesson I have is that, look, if you set out in business, you know, what can go wrong? Well, yeah. When you're young... You're indefeatable. It yeah. doesn't matter. But the thing is, things will go wrong, but that's a lesson. That's yeah. something you've got to say, well, how do, we, how do we turn this into an advantage? Exactly. I mean, it's, a, it's an old saying, isn't it? With every crisis comes opportunity. Yes. But it's making sure you don't have a crisis of confidence to address that opportunity um, and that you find the motivation and confidence to keep moving forward. So do you think that's something you have innately, that you have that ability to look on the positive side, to see opportunities where others might see challenges? I think so. And I think it, you have to have that possibly in your DNA. You have to be of the, the person that always has the, the glasses half full, not half empty. The, yeah. you know, there's, uh, everything is, uh, you get up in the morning and you're going to enjoy it. Yeah. You know, not, oh, this is going to be a bad day. You know, not every day is a good day, but you know, basically you have to have that feeling that uh, you know, you're going to win. And then, you know, the race, the race isn't over until you've won. No matter yeah. no matter. How how many parts along that race, you don't win the race, you're, you're going to win. And, and I think you have to have that, it, it has to be an age, it has to be something that is, uh, is within your, uh, your being and your DNA. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. And continually inventing or coming up with new designs and new products seems to have been key to your business success. How important um, has marketing and innovation been to you? And also, how important do you think it is to business success generally? Well, I mean, the, the only way, really, you can stay one step ahead or, or keep the, uh, um, I won't say the opposition, but certainly your competitors thinking, moving, um, you, you've got to think different ways of doing things. We, uh, I, I, I went on the road because uh, I thought, this is one thing Foster's didn't do. They didn't have a representative going around to the sports shop. So I thought, right, I'm going to do that. And I went around and they uh, and showed them what Reebok, and they say, who's Reebok? And, uh, well, I said, we're Reebok. And then he said, but I've got Adidas, and I've got Dunlop. Why do I need Reebok? Ah, he didn't. I realised he didn't need Reebok. And I realised that me just going around trying to sell to people who didn't want I'm wasting my time. 
So I stopped being a representative. And I thought, what do we do? And it's only when, because we used to go around to events, racing, racing events, 10Ks and whatever, and seeing the athletes there. And we used to sell from the back of the car. And I thought, these are my customers. These, these are the people I've got to sell to. And luckily in those days, the three A's used to produce a handbook. And the handbook had the name and address of every club in the country, of the secretary of every club in the country. Well, to me, that was a no-brainer. That was it. Letters to every secretary offering 15% off. And if anybody in the company would like to be an agent, they can take the 15% and be our agent. Yeah. That first letter got me 100 agents. And that, a second letter went to all the clubs that hadn't really responded, and I got another 50 agents. I ended up with about 250 agents. Yes. And we're selling. Then what do I get? I get the retailers on the telephone saying, I believe you're selling direct to our athletic club. Uh, look, if you stop doing that, we'll, we'll stop your shoes. Now they want me. Yeah. So yeah. we've changed that. But yeah. I said, oh, sorry, no, I'm not going to stop selling. But you will get wholesale price. And I'm sure you can give 15% off to any club member that comes to see you. And if you want to do that, you will be in our advertising and we'll promote you as a retailer. Yeah. So you actually, Joe, you were using guerrilla marketing in the, in, in the terms of being, you know, guerrilla marketing. You were using that before it became, you know, a concept or an idea. Um, you were finding ways of being able to increase your customer base through using lots of different techniques that were not necessarily the most obvious ways of selling your shoes. Right. I don't think we had MBAs then. We didn't have this sort of uh, everything down there that you, you, you can now learn. And you can learn an awful lot with being an MBA. But we, we do a lot of interviews to uh, universities and to MBA students. And uh, we're getting the response. I, I, even the people, the professors, so we don't do it that way, Joe. You know, we don't do it. But you know, the thing is that uh, this is what we did. We went out and we did it. And the problem, I think the problem with any teaching in any university is, is, is history. And I, I think entrepreneurs have to understand, learn that history, really absorb it. But then they've got to take risks. Yeah. They've got to step outside. That's what entrepreneur means. It means learn as much as you can, understand, get the basics right. And yeah. that, that, that is good. But then take a risk. Yeah. Take a yeah. risk. Yeah, don't be defined by the history. Find yeah. a new way of doing things. And in fact, entrepreneurs can do that because big companies are like enormous oil tankers. They can't be as agile in markets as small entrepreneurs can be. So there are lots of opportunities there. And I think you took advantage of every one of them to, um, to, uh, to grow Reebok. I think it's great lessons to be learned. Let me ask you something else, though, because one of the critical things about any business is, is cash flow. It's almost cash is king, because if you run out of money, the business stops, regardless of how good the business is. How did you manage your cash flow in those early days? Well, it, it, is, it is difficult. And I, I think that if anything holds a company back, certainly a company with a product, what holds? What holds you back is, is cash flow, is the, the ability to uh, create the cash. And uh, probably it wouldn't have taken me 20 years to get to America if, uh, if indeed we'd have had more cash. So we, we were limited to what, to what we could do. And for, for me, it was, uh, I got to a certain point where I'm looking for a distributor because a distributor then would take the whole of the production and when somebody could take the production, that eases your cash flow. Because, you know, we were actually a manufacturer and we were actually distributing our, our own product. So there's two jobs here. We were trying to finance this. And, I, and I'm, I'm beginning to look at the American market. So, you know, for all these things, it's quite question, where do you get your cash from? So accepting a distributor was good. I thought it was good at the time. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it was a bit like all your eggs in one basket. And uh, the, uh, I was introduced to the company from, by a good friend who was a real good salesman. And I knew that the sales would be good with, with this man in, in, in control. But unfortunately, 
the head of the business retired and uh, his son-in-law took over and his son-in-law and my friend who was the salesman just didn't get on together. The salesman left and the business went. In fact, they went out of business, uh, nearly taking us with them. And then that, that was an, another story which uh, we recovered from that. We recovered from that by, you know, they were unable to pay for the product that they'd been taken from us. So I had to go and retrieve about 2,000 pairs of shoes. And we had to put a plan together then, what do we do? So we went around to all the schools, got all the uh, PE teachers to act for us. And we were getting more money from, for the shoes at that point than we were actually through the distributor. And, and it, but it took us about three months to recover from all of a sudden our, our uh, production was stopped. I think the distributor took about 80% of our production. We had some sort of own brands we were making for other people. So that was about 20%, but it, it caused probably one of the biggest problems we had because it, it meant really laying off a lot of staff and having to grow again. But we, we did get through it. Again, it's problem solving. How do you do that? But we were talking about cash flow and cash. Yeah, that, that was a big, big problem. And, uh, I knew the only way we could really get over cash flow was to get some volume. And for me, the volume, because we were, we were an athletics company. The big, uh, the big sales in the UK was football. But football, by the time Jeff and I managed to leave J. Drew Foster's, Adidas were in the country and they took the football market. To get J.W. That, Foster had that, didn't they? J.W. Foster was selling football boots, I think exactly, if I read correctly. To most of the football league clubs in the very going back to the you know early days. Yes, indeed. We we have a letterhead of J.D. W. Foster's, and on the letterhead, <coughs> there are 96 teams, and I I can only name one, which is Tottenham Hotspur, yeah. that are not on that list. Otherwise, Manchester United, Man City, Arsenal, yeah. Everton, Chelsea, all these teams, they were supplying with the uh, with boots and with training shoes. Mm. And this, this was from the 1920s. Mm. And, and of course the business continued into the, uh, um, into the 40s, mm. you know, 1940s, the business continued. Um, but somewhere, my grandfather died in 1933, which was 18 months before I was born. And I was born on his birthday, which is why I'm called Joe as well. <clears throat> he was Joe Foster. So I was born and grandmother insisted I brought my name with him. But when his sons take, took over, they obviously didn't see the value or didn't know how to capitalize on that value. Yeah. And maybe maybe that's why, why they argued. My father did some, he, he moved into machine manufacture as against hand sewn, but they were small. They needed to be bigger and they couldn't move into that uh, into the football market. They didn't take advantage of that. Yeah. Uh, football boots in those early days were made out of a leather, kip leather, very thick, mm. greasy leather. Which yeah, was, like, the football, like, like the footballs themselves, which yeah. were so heavy. And, That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were so heavy in those days. And so, you know, Foster's never moved into that. And somewhere around here, Adidas came along, and Adidas didn't move into that, but Adidas, They'd been making, uh, I think they made slippers and whatever, but they made volume. So they were able to use a lighter weight leather and they had the volume. You know, they, they also had, uh, they were in, in the American zone in, uh, in Germany and the Americans, they wanted, they, they wanted football boots for the, for the American football. They wanted that. So I think Adidas were able to take advantage of yeah. a lot of uh, people looking, looking for the market and looking for product. Yeah, which we weren't, but for whatever reason, by the time we got round to leaving and setting up uh, Mercury, which became Reebok, yeah, we didn't have the advantage of the football market. Mm. So I'm I'm looking for how do I increase the market, America? I'm looking yeah. across there, and I know that every college, uh, every university has coach, and you can go to those universities and colleges on a scholarship, a sports scholarship. I think we have Loughborough in the UK. That's about it. Otherwise, you can get all these big colleges. And Foster's themselves did have an arrangement with Yale University. They used to send 200 pairs of hand-sewn shoes a month to Yale. 
it was Bob G and Jack and uh, Frank Ryan. They, they were head coaches there. So I knew it was there was something across there. And this is probably, again, to get to America would cost money. And uh, the family didn't think that really we could afford that. And we couldn't. But fortunately, I, I was reading a magazine called Eurosport. And the government, the government were advertising and saying that we want you to export. And we will provide you with a stand at the NSGA show. That's the National Sporting Goods of America in Chicago. We'll provide you with a stand and the return effort. And we'll pay 50% of your hotel bills and your expenses while you're out there. I had no objection from the family. I could go. This is 1968. Yeah. And I went. But, you know, this is the overnight success. It took me 11 years. It was 1979 before I actually got that foothold. Yeah, yeah. I had six failed attempts. Six attempts. I got people. They love the shoes. They, they love the product. And I remember in, in 1968, they say, well, where, where do we buy this from? And I'm saying England. Mm. England, is that New England, they say? No, no, no. <laughs> no, not New England. Oh, right, is that near London? Yeah, near London. That's, that's a, but you know, the Americans are not good at importing. They, and you, you can understand a, re, a retailer, a retail store to import from the UK. There's a lot of things to go through. So I realized we needed a distributor. And I had six attempts, six people trying to become distributors and all failed. Mm. Couldn't get in. But the big block that we had was running. Running became big in America during yeah. the 70s. And with it, a magazine called Runner's World. And Runner's World had grown from a single A4 page to a full, glossy, 50-page magazine that everybody read. And... Uh, 350 million Americans, 10% were now running. That's 35 million. And Bob Anderson of Runner's World decided he could tell everybody which was the number one shoe. <laughs> and it was Nike. And he said, this is Nike. So everybody, well, 10% of that, we'll say three, 3 million Americans, because they all love something new. 3 million Americans want that shoe. But, you know, Phil Knight, he's, he's importing from Japan. And can you turn the wick up on anything? Can you turn the manufacturing? No, he couldn't get those three million pairs. By the time they're coming through, a year has gone by. Bob Anderson decides there's another number one shoe out now. And this is not the Nike one. It's probably a New Balance. I can't remember which one. <clears throat> However, same result. Yeah. And the, yeah. Retail, the retail business was going wild about that. They couldn't, they couldn't stand that at all. So Bob Anderson, again, he was either told to do it or he thought it out. Instead of having number one, we'll, we'll change that to a star rating. And five star, that would be the top shoes, and there could be four or five five star shoes and going down. At that point, I knew, I knew we could make a five star shoe. You know, we're in the business. We're, we're close to it. We know what they're looking for. And so we made a five star shoe. And we tested this out. Who tested that out at the Commonwealth Games in uh, Edmonton, and we got a shed load of medals, which was really good. Yeah. So the, so the U.S. market was important for you in developing that, but what about manufacturing, um, Joe? Um, because initially you were designing R and D manufacturing from uh, from Bolton Berry from 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 the UK. Yes. When did you start to look at um, moving any of that overseas i think i read somewhere that you started to think about doing some of your um r d in in um in in i think it's, was it south korea but i think there was a, a um a, a part of the world where you moved to did you move manufacturing at all well what happened then is it's part of the story because that uh, i knew that there's an opportunity here we could make a five-star shoe all of a sudden instead of trying to push into america this would be the hook this would they, they use that term in America, the, the hook. You need the hook, something that draws you in. And the five-star shoe would draw us into America. And uh, so the man who sort of got us into the, uh, the, the deal where our distribution fell apart, he had moved to Barter. And he had become the, the, uh, the sports division of Barter. So I, I had to deal with him. Look, if we get a five-star shoe, will Barter help? Yes, Barter would help. 
So Barter said, yes, we'll, we'll make the shoes for you. And um, it was in the uh, 1979, the Kmart, big distributor in America, Kmart came up and yeah. said, we want 25,000 pairs. And we still didn't have a, a five-star shoe at that time. We had the shoe made, but it, it wasn't, wouldn't have been until about another six months before the shoe edition came out for, for us. The, um, the edition of... Um, the shoe, edition. The, the shoe edition was just come out. That's Runner's World. So we were in advance of that. But uh, running an athlete, uh, running was becoming so big that came out wanted. They they wanted 25,000 pairs. Well, that's about six months work for our small factory. Okay. And I say, Barter, Barter would uh, work on that one. But they then said, well, but we want a better price. Mm. Ah. Well, Barter could do it slightly better, but a better price meant. South Korea. There they could do the product at less than half the price that we could. And I'd also made arrangements. I'd got to know some people uh, who were agents for a South Korean company. So I was, I was covering that in the hope that we got our five star. And if we did, I had both fields covered. And initially, we did get a five star. And initially, Barter did work for us. But really, we had to go to South Korea. Um, which did change a lot of things in the company, but that, that I think was probably, it was like a lot of balls in the air at that time. Do we get a five star? We're going to need production. We can't do it. And then we're going to need better prices. So a lot of things changed at that, at that point of time. We did all the R and D in the UK. though. We, we did the R and D in the UK. And, uh, I mean, Barter got it all wrong, but uh, in, in, a, in a funny way, it, it worked. It helped um, get over a cash flow situation. Of, I, yeah. <coughs> they made 20,000 pairs for us, and uh, about 10% of those were wrong. Yeah. But, when, uh, when not, not, all, not, not all good things can last forever. I mean, you know that businesses grow almost in the same part have the almost the same lifespan as human beings you know that kind of you know the um the, the slow start then the more rapid growth in that kind of adolescent phase and then maturity before it starts to decline when other uh, brands other competitors start to, to pick up did you did you ever think um did you ever think that Reebok could become an immortal company and actually continually reinvent itself looking at sports fitness apparel I don't think Reebok I mean tell me if I'm wrong I'm not sure Reebok moved into fashion shoes almost you know which is you know the kind of the the, uh, the trainers that you wear um, more as a fashion element rather than running in them yeah well we're all fashion companies now we can't avoid that we're all but I mean the big thing is that uh, we had this five star shoe which uh, we, we got in the in the August really in shoe edition because at the uh, at the Chicago show in in February after seeing Kmart along came Paul Feynman. Paul Feynman was running a, a small um, outdoors wholesale company <coughs> in Boston, and that was called Boston Camping. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> no, don't worry. Have a have a, have a have a have a drink, Joe. Just have a yeah. just have a, a sip of a sip of water because you know you've been talking for so long and telling us such exciting things about the business. It's not surprising you need another another sip of your your <laughs> water. Yeah, there we go. Well, we can carry on. And uh, so Paul Fireman came along to see me, and he was Boston camping. They were a small outfit, and I could tell that he was rather fed up of being doing what he was doing. They've been doing it for 10 years, the same thing, the same thing. And they said, Joe, if you get a five-star shoe, I'll be your distributor. Okay, fine. So we're in February, February to, uh, to the end of July. And that's quite a long time. So I went across to America, <clears throat> went to see Kmart. I also went to see Paul. And in Kmart, they, they sent me into a big warehouse to talk to a man who was one of 90 different buyers. And I'm thinking 25,000 pairs. 
this could be my first big order and my last big order if we don't satisfy the uh, the financial requirements of the square footage that they they give to us. But with Paul, I like Paul. I could get on with him. We could talk. We would talk the same language. We're both small. We're both happy to do 10 pairs of something rather than 25,000 pairs. And uh, Paul came across the UK, so I have a look at what, you know, he'd never heard of Reebok. So he came across. And we took him to, to events where Reebok uh, sh show him that, yeah, about 50% of the people running in those events were wearing Reebok. And we also knew that the winner would we were in Reebok. <clears throat> I think Paul knew that also, that we were showing him things that, <laughs> that we had we had organized. But at least he found, at least he saw the fact that Reebok wasn't just a figment of the imagination, that uh, we were there. And uh, we got our five-star shoe. And yes, we started to grow on the market. Paul ordered 20,000 pairs that went to Barter and said, Barter got them slightly wrong, so he never paid for those shoes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they offered him at 50%, but he said, no, they'd done two things wrong. One, because they were manufacturers, they'd actually changed the shape of the, uh, the upper. They, they made it easier for the people on the machines to machine round. Mm. They'd taken some of the look away. But also, we were using a material called EVA, which is like a sponge rubber, but it's plastic. And this is very new. And Barter, being a very big company, had their own rubber factory, so they made their own EVA. Unfortunately, <clears throat> we were the first. They were making it specially for us, and they, I'd say 10% of it they got wrong. They didn't cure it right, so that when you put weight on it, it collapsed rather than sponge. So that was the cause of the problem, and, uh, and Paul Feynman wouldn't pay for them. And, we wouldn't allow any, anything to happen to the shoes apart from destroying them. So all Paul Feynman did was just anything came back, he just returned. He just sent a new pair, which helped him get over that period until we got into, uh, into South Korea. And then the shoes were coming at the right price, the quality was right and everything. But running, running wasn't to be our, uh, well, it wasn't where Reebok grew because we had a man down in, in California, in Los Angeles, called Atel Martinez. Atel, his wife, Frankie, she's going to aerobic classes uh, and come back. And uh, the, uh, Frankie and her friends were really full of it. And I was saying, what are you doing? And she said, we're, we're actually uh, exercising to music. And it's fantastic. So Arnold went to the next instructor, right, next class, saw the instructor in his sneakers, saw half of the class in sneakers. The rest of the class were not wearing sneakers at all. Okay. This, is, this was his light bulb moment. He thought, why don't we make a shoe specifically for aerobics? Why don't we make it on a woman's last so that it's a woman's size and only in women's sizes? We're not going to make this in men's sizes. <clears throat> so he went, he called, he called it the red eye, up to Boston, and saw Paul Feynman, and he's saying to Paul, Paul, this is going on. Look, fantastic. And Paul's saying, slow down, slow down. Oh, I don't know. We're a running company. Why should we start making dancing shoes? Uh, well, but he'd spotted, an, he'd, spotted, he'd spotted an opportunity. And, and that's what you've done, I think, throughout your career, is being able to spot opportunities but you've had the connections and the relationships with people to in order to uh, to take them forward let me ask we've got a few questions coming in from um, from the audience i don't okay. want to hog all the time with you and so i want you to ask i mean what they're interested in is if you were starting out again joe what would you do differently well do you know something uh we we grew to be we bigger than Adidas, bigger than Nike. We became number one. What's to change? Yeah, yeah. So then in that case, if you were to give our, our students or graduates that are listening in on this, one piece of advice when thinking about entrepreneurship, setting up an enterprise, what would it be? What's the one piece of advice that you think is critical when starting a business? Well, you know, there are, there are many bits and pieces I can talk about. 
But the one main thing is fun. Have fun. Yeah. If you're not having fun, it's tough. But have yeah. fun. And, you know, people say, what are the three most important things? And I say, have fun. And then the next one is have more fun. And thirdly, have much more fun. Now, that doesn't mean to say that every day is going to be fun. It's not. Yeah. But yeah. you have the attitude. You, you love it. You, you've got to be in love with it. It's yeah. family. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You've got to love what you do because there are going to be enormous challenges. You've got to be passionate about it. You really have. So what help did you get when you were starting out? And what sort of help would you have liked? What would have really helped? Did you, know, did you was there help around? I mean, you did mention that there was the, uh, the export initiative that the government had, which helped you get into the US. What, what else um, would you have liked? to help at the, um, uh, at the beginning? Well, you know, I, I found that listening to people is always very useful, much more useful than having people listen to you. <laughs> listening to people is so good. And in our, in our early days, um, it was very obvious the shoe industry was moving to the Far East, was moving to South Korea, all the shoe industry. And a, a lot of companies were just, they were just going out of business. And so, the result of that was there were auctions, shoe auctions, or many of them, at least one a month. And so I used to go to the auctions to buy a machine or to buy leather, or whatever it is. And uh, I happened to be, well, I sat next to a man called John Willie Johnson. And he had two large factories in Bakeup, which is about 50 miles into Rossendale Valley. And uh, on one occasion, I'd bought so much leather and I put it in my van and I got stopped on the way and, and I was fine for being overloaded. And I, I told, I sat next to John Willie, I told him this story. And he said, Joe, he said, why don't you come with me next time? We'll come together, you know, because we're 50 miles and most of these sales are down in Northampton, Leicester and, and that area. Okay, so I said, right, we'll do that. And I sit next to him and... He never bought an item, never. He never put a bid in or anything. But there were so many items uh, you, you can imagine in a shoe factory, nobody wanted. And so the auctioneer would look at John Willie and John would just nod. And after the auction was over, he'd just go into the room with this man and uh, the, the, the auctioneer and they'd sort out obviously how much he would pay for what nobody else wanted. And we, we're driving back. So I said to John, I said, what do you do with all this stuff? I mean, you, do, you must be buying or you're taking, certainly. You know, so much stuff. He said, oh, next time. Next, he said, come a little earlier next time we go to an auction and I'll take you through this uh, big warehouse. And it was a big, it was full of everything. He took me in. And there, was, there are stuffed bears, there are stuffed crocodiles. There's <laughs> everything you can think of. And it was during this, and I spotted a machine he had there. It was called a pounding up machine. It wouldn't, it takes the wrinkles out of uh, when you're we are lasting uh, a pair of shoes, it takes the wrinkles out. And I said to John, I said, John, look, I'd love that machine. How much do you want for it? And he said, no, I'm not selling it. He said, well, can I, can I rent it? No. Oh, okay then. He said, you can have it. All right. He said, just give it me back when you finish with it. Oh, okay. And not only that, his men actually brought it down to our small factory, put it onto our production line and wired it up. And he did that with at least five machines. In fact, it got to the point where he would ring me and said, Joe, I've just picked up a machine and I'm pretty sure he knew what we wanted. Mm. And yeah. so he just, he just said, no. I don't want anybody. Give me back when you when you see. And those are the sort of people that make a difference. Yeah, 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 exactly. There's a question on coming in on on the chat, and again, we've obviously got people um, listening in who are interested in you know starting to manufacture sportswear. Mm. How do you start to look for sportswear manufacturers if you haven't done that before? So how would you if if you were starting now? How would you start to look for a sportswear manufacturer? Um, well, 
do you look for a manufacturer or are you becoming a manufacturer? Well, well let's assume they're looking for a manufacturer. Let's, let's, let's say some designs, but they want someone to start manufacturing. Would, would, you, would you look in the UK or would you start looking overseas? What would you do? Well, I think it depends where you want to be on the market, whether you want to be exclusive or fairly high level. Uh, you could do that. Uh, overseas, certainly you would get the expertise these days. Uh, I think you can get design expertise in the UK um, and a lot more in the USA. But really, when it comes to production, you've, you've got to find out where, where, where you get your production from. And I mean, I could give you a name right now. Um, Stephen Rubin, <laughs> he, um, uh, which uh, uh, that is ASCO. You would probably know, you would probably know them as JD Sports. Yes, yeah, yeah. And JD yeah. Sports uh, are one of the biggest sports uh, retailers in the world these days. In fact, I was, uh, we exchanged, e I exchanged emails with Stephen and he said he never expected to be one of the biggest supply, one of the biggest customers of Adidas and Nike mm -hmm. from, from mm -hmm. where, where we came to, because uh, we worked very closely with Stephen for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so he's a person I would go to. I don't know anybody else in at the moment, but uh, you have to go and talk to people who know where to get the product from. And yeah, yeah. This, this company knows the product. So yes, I would I would send people in that direction. And uh, but uh, starting start a brand. I, I used to think it would be difficult, more difficult now to start a brand, but a lot of people starting brands. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're we're going down, we will be in London next week. We're, we're filming with a guy called Tommy Mallet. Not <laughs> Tommy Mallet. Not yeah. Tommy Mallet. Tommy yeah. Mallet. Tommy Mallet, he, he, he has footwear shops, he has down, uh, down in London, and he's also, they're also doing a TV programme with him. Yes, yes. Yeah. And he wants me to be on one of his TV programmes, so we're down there filming. Um, and uh, his, his relationship through a, another person we know very well is with Asco or with Stephen Rubin, so he's probably using Stephen Rubin to manufacture his product. Yeah, no, that's that, that, that's fascinating. And of course, now, I mean, you were saying there are lots more brands and lots more, um, you know, businesses starting up. Social media has made an enormous um, change to the, the, the speed at which this can happen. But there also then there's a downside to that. So, it, it, yes, you can get to a very wide market. You can get to it, but you've got to then be able to innovate constantly in order to be able to be relevant to those markets. So do you think um, social media has made um, a, a, a good contribution to um, the, uh, the prevalence of, of brands in, in, in the sportswear area? Well, we can't change social media. Social media is here now to stay, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and it's where people do see. People, you know, you get companies like Adidas and uh, uh, Nike, probably even Reebok, we we're just part of the business now mm -hmm. and a lot of people like something a bit different you know they like to be a bit different and you were you were referring to it earlier these companies not many of these new companies are performance companies they're mainly fashion companies yeah. and they're being driven by sport and so th that is an area that you now people can actually make a product which is just simply fashion driven but it's also influenced sports influenced mm -hmm. and uh, and you were also talking about uh, going through recessions that uh, yes. in my time i must have known a lot of recessions yeah we never had a recession and why is that well the answer to that is that sport has been something that's been growing all the time sport has been growing all the time yeah. and it's it's growing even more um, you know, the more we have AI, the more we have robotics, the more we, uh, we see the future, the more that people will want to do things. And yeah. that is more sport, what they do is more sports driven. Yeah. So yeah. There is much more sport and the influence of sport now on footwear and on apparel, the influence is tremendous. You know, we've got Nike now, they're something like a $25 billion business. And that's big. I think Adidas is somewhere between 15 and 18. And in by 1930, I think it is, uh, 
uh, ABG are promising that uh, Reebok will be 10 billion. I would forecast bigger. I would think Reebok will be 15 billion at least in uh, by 1930. So, you know, these are the things. Sport is driving fashion, and fashion, everybody wants a piece of fashion. We're all dressing down, we're all having comfort. And uh, there's a lot of space in that, a lot yeah. of space. Yeah. And, uh, the and of course, the, the other area that, that, that's interesting is uh, the aspect of wearable technologies, particularly with sport. So being able to actually um, be able to measure your heart rate through the T-shirt you're wearing. Um, but, you know, wearable technologies moving away from just simply you having a, you know, a, a, a wristband to do that, but having it as part of your entire apparel. So I'm sure there's a lot of exciting work that's going to be done in the future. And this could well um see more new and interesting businesses formed as we go forward well yes i mean this is um i mean you say that and it's absolutely right because we've been in dubai at a technology exhibition and uh, we've met people and they have devices now mm. this, this is all being worked upon and you know they're talking these these things are there they're out there and it's, it's amazing where the technology is leading now yeah and yeah uh, Certainly, yes, you, you bring it together to like to apparel where you're going to put it in apparel or it's going to be something separate. But certainly, uh, certainly right now, technology, it's, uh, it's yeah. going on leaps and bounds. Yeah. There's another question uh, come through on the chat, um, which is, you know, what, what was the what was the moment in time when you decided you wanted to go on this path of entrepreneurship? What was that moment in time? What, what, what pushed you to do that, to make that decision? Well, I guess, uh, I guess we didn't even understand the word entrepreneur. Maybe, maybe it was in the dictionary, but uh, I don't know if it was in my dictionary. But I... <laughs> Might have been in your Webster's dictionary. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But we, I, we left the company. We left the foster company because, as I said to my dad, you know, we've got to do change. We've got to do something. And all my father could say to me was, look, uh, when, when I'm gone and your uncle's gone, this company's yours. You can do what you like with it. And my reply to him was, look, Dad, number one, we don't want you to go. You know, we, we're not wishing that on you at all. But um, well before you've gone, this company will have gone because this company is going nowhere but down. Mm. And so I, I guess... That that said, said, well, if that's happening and we need to change, then is that entrepreneurship? Probably it was being an entrepreneur. It was like having the, uh, the stupidity or the uh, confidence, the confidence, whatever it is. But we, you know, when you're young, and I think I think to me, you know, people say. How old do you need to be to be an entrepreneur? And I say, well, you can probably be it at any age. Really, it helps when you're young. Yeah. Because you can, yeah. you can stand failure. Yeah. And you, you have less to lose, Joe. You have less to lose. Well, yes, you literally nothing yeah. to lose. Jeff yeah. and myself, we didn't have anything to lose. Yeah. It was like saying, well, yeah, we can do it. We didn't, uh, you know, we didn't think we would fail or could fail, but mm -hmm. you can fail. But when you're young, you can take it. Yeah. And, and you can take that as a lesson. You know, don't, don't take failure as something that, uh, something just so that you lie down and die with. No, failure, failure is a, it's like a problem. Yeah, just you learn from it. Yeah. And you learn from it. You yeah. take another turn. You, uh, you, you do something that, right, well, we were obviously doing it wrong. Or if we weren't doing it wrong, we weren't doing it good enough. You've got to learn that lesson and yeah. you've got to be able to put yourself in a new direction. Yeah, um, we're almost coming to the end of our of our session. And I know I did say at the beginning, we could probably talk talk for a long time. And I, I do need to let you go and uh, and, and uh, at least recover from this uh, this fireside chat. Uh, but let me let, let, let me ask you what, uh, just a couple more questions. The last one, the last from the last one from the audience. Um, you know, were there moments when you felt like giving up? And what kept you going? Well, I think to answer the first one, were the moments felt like the answer is no. 
and we never we never got to that feeling of giving up and what keeps you going what keeps you going is you build a family you build a culture you build a winning culture you build um an inclusive culture you have everybody in there is on the same team they're all wanting things to succeed uh, you keep away from ego <laughs> egos are not good you want people who will share you want people who will listen and you want people who give input and feel feel apart feel belonging and and if you can engender that into your company you yeah. know the, there's so many people on your team that you don't fail you there's somebody who can help yeah we can help with this we can help and your team your team doesn't necessarily mean all the people you employ the people you buy off the people you consult they become a team um i i had a great lawyer he was an unusual man but uh, as part of the team you know i would ask him a question mm. and he would sit there sometimes for we'll say a good six to seven a minute maybe just thinking um and you you could see he was going through him just like a chess game he was playing out we do this and simply when uh, when i'd asked him a question whatever it was and his answer after probably a minute or so would be yes yes just, yes <laughs> he figured it out he knew i didn't want to know the intricacies the way he would do it yes yeah. and, and that was part of a team and you know all and those people they mean so much yeah i know um, i know <laughs> joe, joe it's been an absolute pleasure um it really has been an absolute pleasure um talking to you today we've not had enough time to talk about things i mean we've we've touched on things you know the importance of brand the importance of innovation you know your ability to be open to new opportunities the thing we didn't talk much about was about people and teams but you just highlighted that now the, the importance of the, of the people in your organization not just the people that work for you but those that you um that supply your business and those you sell to all of that and and i suppose one of the most important is that not to be afraid of risk uh, but to learn from it, that resilience. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Do you think Reebok will rise again and relive its former glory? I have no doubt. <laughs> and Joe, I'm, I'm not in any, any doubt. And uh, I know that uh, if, if you were there still, then that would absolutely be happening. Um, I'm so pleased that you took the time to talk to me today and for sharing your thoughts. It was incredibly inspiring. Um, it would have been lovely to have worked with you over those years. I'm sure you were a fantastic person to work with. And um, I'm sure um, the audience listening to this have really enjoyed it. So I'm going to say um, goodbye to everyone now. I'm thanking Joe so much. Please connect with us here at the Masood Entrepreneurship Centre, um, www.entrepreneurship.manchester.ac.uk. And look out for other events that are planned throughout the year. And of course, we've got a range of programs that we offer to encourage you to be more entrepreneurial. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and we hope to see you again at our future events. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening in. Thank you so much and, and, and good night to you all. And Joe, once again, um, I applaud you. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. It's an absolute pleasure talking to you too. And can I invite you to follow us on Instagram? You most certainly can. And we absolutely will do. And uh, I am going to read your book thoroughly as soon as I get a copy, which I'm now waiting for. I can't wait to get hold of it. Um, but yeah, thank you so yeah. much. You and look life, after yourself. I will. Take life care. has been an adventure so far, but there's a lot more adventure ahead. <laughs> and that's what keeps us going. Well, enjoy, enjoy the next adventure, Joe. Um, you look after yourself. Take care. Love to you, everyone, uh, your family and all of your friends. You look after yourself. Take care. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you very much. Bye bye.